This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. So today it's my pleasure to talk with uh, Sheena Jocelyn. She's a professor of psychology and physiology at the University of Toronto, and she's also a senior scientist at Children's Hospital up there in Toronto, which I think is where your labs are. Yes. Yes. And uh, so Sheena is at the forefront of research aimed at understanding how memories are stored, retrieved, uh, erased, uh, where, what, when, and how. And so that's what she's going to enlighten us about today. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of the science, could you talk about when and during your life did you become interested in learning in memory and kind of how you're, you ended up getting into being a researcher in that area? Yeah, thanks, Mark, for having me. This is, um, it's, a, it's, it's a fun topic, I think, looking at memories. But to be honest, I wasn't always really interested in memories. I went through my sort of um, undergraduate college degree, just sort of thinking, you know, I, I really want to get an MD and maybe I'll be a pediatrician, maybe I'll be a psychiatrist, I'm not quite sure. And then I, um, I decided that I would work for a summer for my family doctor. And um, I was a receptionist for him. And, um, and I thought that my job being a receptionist was more interesting than his job. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I could type really fast and answer the phone and do all these things. And his job just seemed really kind of mundane. Now, yes, he was a, you know, family physician and, and you know, super duper guy, but it sort of convinced me that maybe being an MD, at least a family doctor, was not for me. So I um, was sort of lost in my last year of my undergrad thinking I need to get a, I need another science credit to graduate. I don't know what I want to do. Maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try that. So I took a course in psychology um, from uh, Rick Benninger at Queen's University. And it sort of changed a lot of my career trajectory from there. We studied actually um, Larry Squire's book about memory. And we took it chapter by chapter and it was a small uh, group seminar. And um, I found it fascinating. I thought this, I really like this. This is, you know, I can sort of understand, I can relate a little bit, you know, I have a memory. I can sort of think about what this might mean for me and it's sciencey, um, but I thought that I needed a little bit more on the psychology side because I was sort of a pre-med major. And um, so I went and did two more years of just straight psychology classes. And from there, I, um, I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe I wanna help people, but still do like really hardcore research in the lab. So I did um, a, a, a master's degree in clinical psychology at Queens, where um, I learned all the sort of clinical, I was gonna go on and get my clinical PhD and, and maybe be a practicing psychologist, maybe not, but definitely doing sort of hardcore uh, rodent research. Um, so I would you know, run rats all the time and then do these clinical things on the side. And um, after a while I decided it was exactly, exactly all researchers. I mean, it sort of starts and ends, you know? Um, I decided that I needed a change of scenery because I had seen a lot of the same faces. I did, you know, my undergrad at the same place where I was doing my master's. So I switched to do my PhD to the University of Toronto and their um, pretty, pretty amazing psychology department. But they did not offer um, a clinical PhD. I had to go entirely research, which I did. And I studied a little bit on addiction, a little bit on um, food seeking, a little bit on all these different things under Franco Vaccarino. And it was really interesting. I liked it. But I thought, you know, I, I'm not ready to give up the clinical. So on the side, I um, got a, a clinical job with people um, where I would, would assist um, an actual um, psychologist, a trained psychologist, a licensed psychologist. And I worked with um, sex offenders um, in an outpatient clinic. And um, I found that work super challenging. Uh, it was um, interesting and I really liked it. And at the end of my PhD, um, so people that do a lot of behavioral studies in rodents, they'll know this. I, I hadn't taken a weekend off in a long time. 
And I really wanted a job for a while where I could get my nails done and not wear gloves. That was my, that was my thing. I want to have my nails done. I want a weekend off. So I decided to do a, a postdoc where I would just focus on the clinical aspect and sort of backdoor my way into getting um, a clinical psychology degree. Um, so I did f- pretty much full time um, at um, uh, Clark Institute of Psychiatry, now called um, CAMH, working again with sex offenders. And um, I went to prison a few times a week and did assessments. And um, as you can imagine, or for, for some people, I sort of thought I was Jodie Foster, you know, in the movie um, uh, Silence of the Lamps. I thought I was going to meet the evil genius and match wits with the smartest person on earth and sort of see who came out on top. Um, but I never met that person when I was doing this work. I, I just sort of ended up being, again, really, um, really quite bored. And, you know, it, was, it felt like the same conversation I was having over and over and over. And um, working with sex offenders, uh, it was, was not a lot of fun. So I decided, okay, this is, I'm done with people, done with people, especially sex offenders. I want to go back to the lab hardcore. So I moved to uh, Yale where I did an amazing postdoc with Mike Davis. And he was just a, a fabulous person to work with. And across the hall was Eric Nessler's lab. And it was just science, 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 science. And I thought, home, this is me. That I fit in here. I feel like, you know, I can talk to everybody and everybody's really excited. I didn't see that sort of, oh, I gotta go to work sort of thing. People were happy to go to work. They were thrilled to go to work and to talk about it all the time. And then um, unfortunately, um, Mike Davis decided to move his lab. So I found another lab and I worked with Alcino Silva at UCLA. And I really got into memory and molecules and understanding things a bit deeper. And that was amazing. And I loved being a postdoc and all those people out there that's like, I hate being a postdoc. I loved it. I thought it was the best life in the world. You didn't get paid very much, but you got to you know, think and do science and talk with really fun people and have exciting lunches where you just sort of kicked around ideas. But then it was time for me to get my own lab. So I came here um, with my, my um, husband, um, Paul Franklin, who also studies memory. Um, and we've been here at the Hospital for Sick Children since 2003. So it's been a little bit of a, you know, not quite straight line, but I think I've learned an awful lot along the way. And I've, if, if I stop having fun, it's a signal to me that I'm doing something wrong that yeah, there's gonna be off days. Yeah, I, I don't love all aspects of my job, but when I stop sort of being excited, then I think it's it's a signal that I need to change and I haven't had that. So um, I think I'm in the right spot. Yes, and it's always exciting when you have students and postdocs, graduate students and postdocs in the lab and they bring a lot of energy and there's this mystical energy, right? That kind of flows from these younger uh, kids that, in general, so really young kids are very curious mm-hmm. and graduate students are very curious. And hopefully when we get older, we continue to be curious. Absolutely, it's sort of when you stop losing that sense of wonder that I think you're sort of tired of life. Yeah. I think that we need to, um, we need to sort of cultivate that and make it okay for everybody to be, you know, the sort of, you know, curious kid inside that we, yeah. we have to stop being always so, you know, hardcore serious about things. It's, it's sort of nicer to be a bit light and fun and have, you know, curiosity. Yes. Okay. Engrams. Uh, some of our the viewers and listeners might not have ever heard the word engram. What is your definition of engram? Yeah, so I have a very technical definition, which I'm hoping all the, the listeners can uh, can relate to. I, I call it that thing in the brain that seems to store a memory. <laughs> so my, my definition is, is not, it's not very, um, it's not a very good definition because we don't quite know how to define it and at what sort of level of analysis we need to encompass in order to really capture what it is. So is it a change in, you know, um, epigenetic mechanisms? Is it a change in molecules? Is it, you know, the circuits? Is it synapses? Is it how, you know, brain circuits wire differently? And um, I think that that's um, 
a little bit of a problem that we don't quite know what exactly it is that we're studying, but I think it makes it kind of exciting that way because it's still a little bit of an open question. So for my own studies, I call it those bunch of cells, those neurons in the brain that were active when we learned something. And if we could disrupt them later on, we find that we don't remember very well. So to me, that's um, pretty good evidence that these cells are really important in the memory. Now, exactly how this, you know, the mechanism, exactly how, we don't know. And there's, you know, many questions, both at a sort of deeper level and at a sort of a higher level that we're still sort of investigating. Now, uh, over, my understanding is that over 90% of the neurons in the brain deploy the neurotransmitter glutamate, which is an, the excitatory transmitter. And so presumably there's a very important role for these glutamatergic neurons in whatever an engram is. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. So our, our studies have really focused on um, glutamatergic neurons. As you say, it's, it's the major neurotransmitter in the brain and it's the subject of a very cool book that's coming out, a uh, little <laughs> no, but, oh, and, and, and so you say, uh, in your definition, the way you study the engrams, when a neuron, you're studying whether or not neurons are active when an animal is experiencing some learning and memory model, which we'll talk about uh, next, I guess. And, and so by active, do you mean firing an action potential or can it be, so glutamate depolarizes the membrane, causes calcium influx. Right. Is calcium influx in the absence of a action potential sufficient to? Yeah, so we, we haven't even gotten down to that level okay. yet. Yeah. So still, the, the model is we use these right, right now, the field and, and, you know, certainly my lab, we use these sort of larger definitions because we don't know if a cell has to cause, has to fire an action potential or not. Okay. So we, we don't quite know um, exactly how precisely this works. So um, it's, it's, it's great because there's so many um, unanswered questions, but it's also a little dissatisfying because we're not quite sure what it is that we're talking about yet. Well, it, uh, but you are looking at calcium or either fairly directly or indirectly. Can you talk about how you, how you determine whether a cell is, a neuron is active? Right, right. So um, there's several different ways. So and people use different methods. So um, one of the methods that people use is, is a tagging approach. So they infect a bunch of neurons with um, immediate early gene um, transgenic promoters. So when a neuron is active, a lot of times there's influx of calcium, as you say, and um, immediate early genes are expressed. So what people do is they take um, an immediate early gene promoter and they say, okay, we're gonna you know, hook this up with now GFP so that after um, a, a mouse has been in some situation and an event has happened, we can see what neurons were active at the time because these neurons are gonna be expressing GFP. So they'll, and, they'll, they'll fluoresce then this green fluorescent protein yeah. and you can actually look at them glow in, 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 that, in fact, uh, under Absolutely. the microscope. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in my lab, um, we also do a different sort of approach where we take neurons that, you know, they're just random neurons that are infected by a viral vector and we make them more active. So we um, express um, something like the transcription factor CREB, which is how our studies um, first began, or then we can use um, optogenetics or chemogenetics to just um, either slightly depolarize or make the neuron fire. And then these neurons become uh, part of the engram. So you can either see what's happening naturally, or you can cause these neurons to become um, engram neurons. And so with optogenetics, you essentially express a gene that encodes uh, an ion channel that when you shine light on the neuron with one particular ion channel, the neuron will be activated with another type of channel it will be inhibited by light. And Absolutely. then and then with the chemogenetics, it's you you give the animals a chemical 
that kind of does the same same idea. Yeah, and these these technologies have been pretty groundbreaking in in my field of sort of looking at how brain circuits might mediate behaviors because they really allow us to dissect things. So it's you know it's a it's a simplification, but it's a nice simplification to think of. You can sort of turn a neuron on with like something like blue light, and then turn it off with red light. And it's it's um it's a bit more complex with than that, but it's it's a nice easy way of sort of thinking about it. You know, I we skipped a little bit there. I, I I'd like you to just this kind of pause a, a, for a few minutes and talk about a historical perspective on the engram, which uh, several Canadian uh, scientists or MDs made major contributions to the concept conceptualization and to trying to understand at least the initially a crude level, where in the brain memories might be stored. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I'm gonna start way back at the beginning, uh, 1904. Um, there is a German um, scientist um, named Richard Semen, and he was an evolutionary biologist, much in the vein of, um, of you know, the people that would go out and find new species. So very much like Charles Darwin. And in fact, he, he did lead an expedition um, and he, there's like a, a, a salamander or something that bears his name. So he did discover a new species. Um, he ended up getting in a lot of trouble um, academically. Um, he ended up having an affair with the department chair's wife and was kicked out of science. He lost his position, he lost his funding, he did end up marrying this, this woman and they um, moved and he um, started, he was then became a private scholar. He found other funding, but he, his, his sort of career in evolutionary biology was done. So then he started um, just sort of thinking and writing about memory. And um, he wrote two very influential books about memory. Um, one that's called The Meme and where he defined what he saw an engram as. And basically it was those cells in the brain that are active during a memory. And he also defined this other term called ecphory, which is the sort of reading out of this engram that was laid down during an experience. And now, this is this was only this isn't that long after the that it became apparent that there were individual nerve cells in the brain, you know, based on Cajal's work. Uh, and so did Salmon, he knew that he knew that then in his thinking or not? So it's, it's to be honest, his thinking is, is kind of, um, I, th I think that that's us reading into his thinking on that. He didn't mm -hmm. actually say brain cells, but he, so we are sort of taking that he's implying that without actually stating it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very good point. Very good point. But, um, he, um, he didn't make many, many sort of theories about how memories would work, which um, are now turning out to be, you know, that those sound pretty good. But uh, unfortunately, at the time, his, um, his thinking and his books were not widely read in the memory community. They were, um, he, he wasn't part of, you know, the memory community or the research community. He was pretty much out on his own. He, um, uh, his, his, stuff was overlooked and um, uh, his wife ended up dying of cancer and um, he ended up taking his own life. So it's a sort of a, a very sort of sad tale, um, sort of how engrams started. But he was the one who originally um, came up with these terms and these definitions. And then, um, so uh, around a little bit after this, um, again, we have, you're right, some, some really key um, people that sort of took up uh, the, the looking for engrams or finding out what an engram is. So we have um, Carl Lashley, who was um, uh, American um, physiologist, um, and he wanted to find, you know, if this engram exists, let's try and find it. So he did a series of experiments um, over about 30 years. He had other experiments mixed in. He made a ton of contributions. I don't wanna sort of belittle his contributions, but after 30 years, he, um, he couldn't find an engram. 
So in these experiments, what he would do would be to, you know, sort of the archetypal memory experiment. He would train a rat to run through a maze to find a bit of cheese at the end. And um, the rat would get really, really good at learning how to run this maze. So he said, okay, there's our memory. Now I wanna find where in the brain this memory is. So at the time, the sort of, you know, best technique was to do um, lesions. So he did lesioning techniques of different parts of the cortex because he um, must have thought it was, he would find an engram in the cortex. And this was cutting edge stuff at the time, like 1911. Um, and it was, it was really, really cool. And then um, he couldn't find an engram. He couldn't find a place in the cortex that produced memory disruption. So he came up with the, um, the, the, the sort of feeling that, you know, engrams were elusive. We shouldn't really spend our time looking for this sort of mythical engram. He, he compared it to uh, a mythical snark that no one could ever find, even though they kept sort of chasing it. They could never find this snark. So that sort of became, you know, one of the, the feelings in, in the memory and the, you know, science community that, that you couldn't find this engram. But um, he actually was um, he trained um, a very important scientist, um, Donald Hebb. So Donald Hebb is a Canadian scientist and he worked with Lashley and um, Hebb came up with his theory of synaptic plasticity. Basically that neurons that fire together, wire together and that's how you know important brain circuits are made. And um, uh, Hebb didn't call what he was working on in engram, he called it a cell assembly, but there's a lot of really big similarities between what an engram could be and what a cell assembly could be. So um, he's most widely known, of course, for the you know, neurons that fire together, wire together at the synaptic level, but he also has you know, a lot of things about circuits and how they're formed and some really important things. So he's our sort of um, another one of, um, I call them the heroes of the engram, the people that really laid the foundations for what we're studying. Another person is uh, Wilder Penfield. Now Wilder Penfield is a neurosurgeon and he actually started the um, Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, the MNI. And he um, was a brain surgeon who tried to localize um, parts of the brain inducing epileptic seizures in people that had a lot of seizures and couldn't be treated. So these were sort of intractable um, epileptic patients. And he would go in and try and map out little bits of their brain to find out, you know, if I remove this part of the brain, what will happen? And to do that, um, the patients are awake and they're conscious, they're, they're anesthetized, but they can speak because he doesn't want to, you know, mess up any of their language areas or anything like that. So um, he noticed that- And, and every, there's just, yeah. I, I think most people know this, but the brain itself, there are no pain receptors, so you can, in a living person, you can probe around in the brain and they don't feel pain. Yeah, super interesting fact. I mean, I, I yeah, it's very cool that the brain has no pain receptors. So he took advantage of that. I mean, that the patient is, um, you know, probably they're, they're made comfortable. It's probably not an enjoyable experience, but it's not painful. They don't feel anything. Right. That's, that's really important to point out, thank you. So he would stimulate around trying to find where the, the locus of this um, epileptic um, seizure point would be. And he noticed that every now and then he would stimulate, just zap a cell a little bit, and that the uh, patients would say, oh, that reminds me of this time. And it would be like they were recalling memories. And um, any Canadians out there in the audience, they've made this um, Canadian heritage moment about this, where, uh, the, where he stimulates, he zaps the cell, and the patient says, I smell burnt toast, just like my mom made. And um, it was like a very, a very sort of experiential type of memory. And um, so he thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm stimulating a part of an engram that holds this kind of memory. So I think that's a, a really, um, really interesting way of, of sort of, you know, taking something that you see in, in, um, in clinical practice and saying, hey, there's a, a really important scientific finding here as well. So he, he was a, another huge person that, um, that really contributed to our understandings of, um, of engrams and memory. And the last person I'm gonna talk about is um, Brenda Milner. And Brenda Milner is sort of, um, she is an amazing uh, sort of pioneering female scientist, um, also 
you know, close collaborator with Heb, close collaborator with Penfield, also um, works at the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute. And she is still alive. She's 102 or 103. Mm -hmm. And she is, you know, it's, it's amazing. So some, it's, it's, it's just a huge thing. And what she did is she, um, she um, was a psychologist by training and she did a lot of um, looking at how um, different patients, how their memories were affected after different treatments. So she um, famously looked at patient HN. And again, patient HN is one of these patients that had very, very, um, a lot of seizures when he was um, a boy and um, they weren't handled by anything. So they decided to go in and take out bits of his brain. And the bits of his brain that they ended up taking out were the uh, parahippocampal region and some other places. And um, that it stopped the seizures, but he also had um, profound memory deficits. So he could um, meet somebody and be very social and, and very nice to them. They would leave the room and come back and um, he wouldn't remember meeting them a couple minutes ago. So um, she studied patient HM and using um, some really, you know, just sort of thinking, you know, how should I study memory? She made up a bunch of different memory tests, just try and key in on what functions were preserved in this patient and what, what wasn't preserved in this patient. So she um, really sort of honed in on the fact that the, the hippocampus is one brain region that is like super important for memory. And unfortunately, HM had a lot of his hippocampus removed. So these are, so all together, these, um, these, you know, real pioneering scientists, you know, when you take all their contributions, it sort of led us to, you know, a little bit where we were, you know, say 15, 20 years ago, where I think we were sort of poised to sort of study engrams and cellular ensembles that that hold memories in the brain. All right, so let's let's get back. Say so you, you mentioned the hippocampus, and with HM, it really provides strong evidence. It's critical for the formation of new memories. Right. But there are memories stored elsewhere in the brain. That hippocampus is brain region for both its, its position in the brain receiving input from all our senses and kind of these inputs are coming in and converging and so you can for memories so it's been the most heavily studied re region it's also easy to study experimentally the circuitry is pretty simple yeah. the second probably the second most studied region and, and certainly with engrams, maybe the most studied region is not the hippocampus, but the amygdala. And a lot of your work has to do with amygdala, which is important in remembering fearful situations. Um, in your, your recent review article in Science with uh, Tsutsuma Tonagawa, you laid out like four four criteria experiment for experimentally establishing uh, the nature of an engram. Can you go through those? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we wanted to be um, sort of upfront and scientific about how you know, we're, we're claiming that we are finding and manipulating at least core components of an engram. Maybe not the whole thing. We think engrams might be, you know, multiple regions of the brain and typically studies are just looking at one small region, but at least it seems to be a core region of the, of the engram. So we wanted to say, okay, how do we, how do we sort of scientifically know that what we're doing is, is manipulating a specific engram that supports a specific type of memory. So we took a page out of um, uh, Richard Morris's book. So Richard Morris wrote this um, wonderful article about how do you know that synaptic plasticity and LTP is important for memory. And he had a number of criteria and we just sort of borrowed them and, and adopted them for knowing uh, if, if what we're studying is, is indeed an engram. So that bit in the brain that seems to store a memory. So, um, one was that, okay, if, it, if this is the bit of the brain that stores a memory, it should be active 
when we store a memory and it should also be active when we recall a memory. So that, that seems pretty simple. So if this bit of the brain is important in storing a memory, if we interfere with its function, that should also interfere with memory recall. Um, also, if we, if we think this bit of the brain is what's activated when we get a retrieval cue, so something reminds us to think about a memory, um, maybe we could skip the retrieval cue and just artificially go in and reactivate these cells. So that's a bit trickier thing to do. And then if we know a lot about how engrams are made and how they're you know, reactivated when we remember something, is it possible to totally implant a false memory in the brain of a mouse for an event that didn't ever occur? And can we get them to do this behaviorally act as if they had this memory when in fact they never had? So that's a really tricky one. And um, so we thought that th this was a pretty high bar for showing that in fact, these cells that we are um, examining um, constitute a critical component of an engram. And the, the amygdala, the, the neurons in the amygdala are particularly, uh, they have a lot of advantages for this because, uh, why don't you describe the fear memory? How, how do you, uh, do like Pavlovian conditioning of a of a fearful situation. Yeah, yeah. So we we um we're studying sort of complex things in the brain. So what we want to do is to keep the memory pretty simple. So unlike Lashley, who taught you know um, a rat to run a really complex maze over many 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 days, we wanted something that was easy and you know reliable to do that. We, we thought every mouse could certainly learn how to do this. So we took advantage of what you say is Pavlovian uh, fear conditioning. So you remember Pavlov, he would um, play a bell every time he would give a dog something to eat. Play a bell, food, play a bell, food, play a bell, food. And sure enough, if you just play the bell, the dog must think, aha, food's coming. And the dog starts salivating. So we do that exact same experiment, but we wanna make it really quick. So we play um, a tone uh, with a small foot shock. So this foot shock is aversive, but it's, it's, it's a little bit painful, but it's not, it's very similar to like when you drag your feet on the carpet and then you touch a doorknob handle and you go, oh, but it's, it's not lasting. We don't cause any sort of long lasting pain or harm to the mouse. It's just enough to sort of really startle them and get their attention. So we do this once. So it's a five minute procedure. We play a 30 second tone. It ends with a one second foot shock. It's a mild foot shock. And the mouse, this is so startling and so um, not very nice for the mouse to experience that they can remember it for their entire lives. So one trial learning. And that was really important for us to, uh, to do something really simple and very biologically important um, and to make it really easy to read out the memory. So when a mouse um, or a rat or a small rodent is afraid, uh, the mouse adopts a um, freezing posture. So um, it crouches up um, often in the corner, sometimes not in the corner, and it doesn't move. So if you've ever seen like a cat, you know, going after a mouse, first he'll run. And after a while, if he gets cornered, the, the mouse will just sit there and sort of like freeze it. I'm not moving. Maybe they won't notice me. So we, we can study that really, really easily in the lab. And it's a very, um, as I say, it's very um, qualitatively um, and quantitatively easy to study. So we, we do that as our memory uh, manipulation. So we can always tell when a mouse has learned this, we can always tell when a mouse is remembering this. And it's it just is really good when we're doing highly technical things in the brain. Okay, so can you go now like chronologically through you're fine, you know. Uh, so when when you got your faculty position, you know, you took off and you had uh, one postdoc or graduate student in particular, huh? Jin Han, a, a very very um, amazing postdoc. You, you had yeah. two two science papers uh, early on, and can you? And, and you kind of took all this in a logical progression. So yeah. why don't you just go chronologically? Absolutely. So actually the story starts earlier than that. Okay. 
the story starts when I was a postdoc <laughs> way back. Uh, talk about, you know, these, you know, holding on to scientific questions for a while. I feel a little bit like Lashley myself studying the same darn thing for 30 years. But anyway, so when I was a postdoc in Mike Davis's lab at Yale, we were interested in looking at memory and it was rats and we were doing some different manipulations. And across the hall from us, um, Eric Nessler's lab was starting to get into viral vectors. And I thought, this is so cool. So viral vectors allow you to put, you know, whatever DNA you want to into cells. And it was like, this is an amazing technology. We were very, very excited about this. So they had viral vectors that overexpress the transcription factor CREB. And CREB had already been implicated in um, aplesia by Eric Kandel and in um, Drosophila by um, Jerry Yin and Tim Tully. Um, and there was some work going on looking at it in rodents. But what we could do with viral vectors that a lot of other people couldn't do was to increase the levels of CREB. A lot of work can be done by decreasing things, but to increase something was really cool. So what we did is we um, injected this viral vector into the amygdala of rats and did um, this fear conditioning task. And what we saw was enhanced memory. So when we um, overexpressed this transcription factor in the amygdala of, of mice, of rats, sorry, we saw enhanced memory. And this was really, really um, an interesting finding because until that time, there's many different ways you know, you can disrupt a memory or disrupt performance of the mouse doing something, but to actually enhance memory was a big deal for us. So we were very, very excited until we looked at the brains of these mice and we find, found that, you know, I, would do, I was doing the surgery, so I had only infected um, an overexpressed CREB in a really small number of cells. So about 10 to 15% of the cells, these were um, glutamatergic, you know, large, principal neurons in the lateral amygdala, but again, a really small portion of them. And we couldn't figure out why, you know, it, manipulating a really small number of cells had this large influence on memory behavior. So we, we published this finding and we couldn't really ever explain it. And we were just thinking, you know, how is this possible? And well, then- but To me, that's kind of, that's an intriguing finding, right? And so I would say, wow, this is pretty interesting. What's going on? Yeah, well, you weren't one of the reviewers. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. How can this be possible? You know, you're claiming to see this, you know, large increase in memory, and yet you're infecting a really small number of cells, you know, in one brain region. What's going on here? So um, I, I was like you, I'm like, well, maybe there's something to this. So well, fear, memories of fearful situation are like evolutionarily like critical for survival. And so just thinking kind of out of the box kind of makes sense to me that there'd be a lot of uh, uh, that it wouldn't take a lot activation of a lot of neurons. Absolutely, absolutely. So we we um, so I, I went off to um, Alcino Silva's lab and started thinking a little bit more about this question. And then I started remembering what I had heard when I was, you know, psychology PhD about engrams and that memories are sparsely encoded. Not every neuron is important in storing every memory. It's really sparse. So I started thinking, well, maybe the neurons that we you know, overexpress CREB and maybe they were the ones that are important in this engram and maybe they were the ones that are driving this, this enhancement. So um, then um, I started this work when I was a postdoc and then um, it was my postdoc when I started my own lab that really, really put the finishing touches on this. And we did show that indeed these neurons that were overexpressing CREB, right when the animal was um, learning this fearful memory, they were also active when the mouse was recalling this memory. So they weren't active all the time. If we asked the mouse to recall a different memory um, and it was these cells that were active and not other cells. So we thought, well, we're sort of showing that these neurons that were active at the time of the training event are also active at the time of a retrieval event. So to us that said that these neurons um, became part of this engram and we called this process allocation. So these neurons were allocated or recruited into an engram and the other ones 
weren't allocated or recruited to the NGRAM. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we did a lot of sort of correlational work using um, immediate early genes to sort of mark neurons that were active at different time points. And we were very excited about it, but it's, it's very, very correlational. And uh, there's many things that, you know, can be correlated. It doesn't mean that it's really causative. So we said, okay, these findings are cool. Um, we also did other studies where we decreased Krebs function in a small population of neurons and nothing happened to memory. Memory was normal. And when we looked at the brains of these mice and looked for the neurons that are active when the mouse was remembering something, saying, okay, this is a proxy for the engram, that bit of the brain that stores a memory. We found that the neurons that we had decreased Krebs function in were excluded from the engram. So we came up with this idea that you know, there's some sort of competition to become part of an engram because not every neuron gets to become part of an engram for every memory. And the ones that win this competition are the ones with high levels of prep. So um, we, we, we came up with this sort of hypothesis, um, but the challenge really was how to test this, <laughs> which, uh, which is um, Jin He and, and Steve Kushner, who was also really important in this work and Alcino Silva and um, a bunch of other people in my lab, uh, they said, okay, why don't we do, we gotta try the updated Lashley experiment. So what Lashley did was he would train um, a rat on something and then lesion bits of the brain. So we were gonna do that, but instead of lesioning bits of the brain, we're gonna lesion these cells we think are really important in the brain that are important for this particular memory and see what happens to the memory. So using a bunch of um, really, um, cool tools that we borrowed from other fields of science, we did just that. So we tried to allocate neurons to the engram using CREB, and then we would kill these neurons right before we tested um, memory, and we found that memory was disrupted. Now, if we killed a similar number of neurons, but neurons we didn't think were important in the memory, just random neurons, memory wasn't disrupted. So then we thought, okay, we have a, a handle a little bit on what's going on here. That these neurons are important for this particular memory and not another. Nice. And um, there's a, a lot of evidence for structural changes associated, you know, changes in the size of individual synapses and or numbers of synapses. Uh, in, in any of your models that you're describing, have you or others looked and, you know, counted numbers of synapses and so on. Absolutely, absolutely. So we did a little bit of just sort of looking at spines as our proxy of synapses, but the real work um, that's been done at sort of the level of synapses is um, from Bong Kyung Kang's lab in um, Seoul, um, in Seoul National University. And he has this beautiful paper which shows that um, synaptic connections between engram neurons in different brain regions, that's what's really increased when um, this engram gets formed. So you can use different techniques of tagging cells, but the, you know, of course the synapses are super important. And this is just beautiful, beautiful work. The images are just beautiful. And hopefully you and I were, in, we're increasing our connections now and as we, we speak. Oh, absolutely. We are doing really, really good things for our brain. <laughs> uh, oh, what was I gonna ask you? Yes, so this transcription factor CREB that you've studied extensively uh, and manipulated and used it kind of as a, uh, in a way, a centerpiece of studying engrams, so it's activated by calcium influx into the neuron when the neuron's active. What, what are the gene targets of this transcription factor CREB that might contribute to the structural and enduring changes in the, in the neural neurons that are in the engram? Yeah, that's a super question. So many people have looked at that. We tried looking at that um, several years ago, and it's it's really not <laughs> clear. As you say, Krebs is a is a is a transcription factor. It's ubiquitous. It's it's all over the place. It does so many different 
things. Um, and so our approach to it was to say, okay, it does so many different things. Let's try and mimic what it's doing in our paradigm, which is sort of preferentially allocating those neurons with increased levels of CREB to an engram. Why don't we try and mimic that using other, other manipulations and see if we can find something that looks like it's acting very similar to CREB. So we ended up um, looking at um, excitability, intrinsic excitability of a neuron. So um, some really lovely work had come out of um, Rob Malenka and Eric Nessler's lab showing that if you overexpress CREB, you increase the intrinsic excitability of a neuron. So we looked at other ways of um, increasing intrinsic excitability of a neuron without directly affecting CREB. So we used um, a, um, a dominant negative potassium channel and then we just used optogenetics and chemogenetics as other ways of just trying to increase the activity of a neuron in different sort of ways. And we found that we could recapitulate what, what my lab ended up calling the CREB effect, which was a short form for if you overexpress CREB, these neurons become important in the memory trace or, or in the engram. So in our lab, we didn't go on to look at the downstream genes. We sort of looked at you know, what process in the cell might, might CREB be, be um, affecting to um, preferentially allocate these neurons. Well, there is, I guess it's worth mentioning BDNF brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is activity dependent and has a lot of pretty strong evidence, I think, plays some role in, in learning and memory. And it's definitely a targeted CREB. Absolutely, absolutely. We did some initial studies, um, but then, um, to be honest with you, uh, the postdoc in my lab who was working on it got a job and we never ended up following up on those studies and they, they went off in a new direction. And it's like one of those sort of hangovers that's like just hanging out there in my lab and you know, somebody else wants to come along and, and grab it. I think there's a really important story there. In, uh, in animals, and, and there's evidence for this in humans, that there are ways to, to enhance cognition or, or at least prevent impairment of cognition. One is what we're doing now, keeping your neurons exercised. Another is uh, physical exercise. And uh, we did some work on intermittent fasting. But one thing that's pretty interesting that's emerging that you may be interested in is the role of mitochondria mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in synaptic plasticity and uh, perhaps in, even in, a, so if you form new, form new synapses or strengthen connections, then that means that probably you need increased energy supply to right. these new synapses. And we did some studies where we used RNA interference to, to knock down expression of a gene called PGC1 alpha. Mm -hmm. which is a CREB target gene. And PGC1-alpha stimulates the what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, the division mm -hmm. of mitochondria. And then those mitochondria move to synapses. And we found in, uh, in vivo in the hippocampus, if we reduce mitochondrial biogenesis, then over a period of weeks, synapses are lost. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't look at learning and memory, but this is something that's probably a connection with energy metabolism. Neurons are more active, they require more energy, and then there's this kind of a enduring effect on the cell being able to provide the energy needed to maintain the new connections. This, yeah. No, I, I love that. I love that line of thinking, like in... in you know, thinking of human interactions, it's always follow the money. But I think in looking at brain interactions, it's follow the energy dynamics because that's probably driving an awful lot more of what's going on than, than I tend to think about. So I think that's a really, a really cool point. I'd love to study that a bit more. Unfortunately, there's, you know, with, with calcium and CREB, there's good tools. With mm -hmm. energy, for example, there are no, to my knowledge, no fluorescent probes for ATP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've thought about this for years. Geez, I wish I could, we did a lot of calcium imaging and mainly in cultured neurons. I wish I could image 
ATP levels, you know, and see what happens. And yeah, yeah exactly. Because a lot of times, what the your real question you can't ask because there's just no way of asking it. So you ask a sort of higher up level question, and that is semi satisfying, but not really what you're interested in finding out. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk about. Uh, you mentioned um, a couple other things you haven't talked about yet. Uh, one is implanting a false memory. Yeah. Can that be done? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's nice with a lot of trouble. So um, it's we're not quite at the science fiction level yet in people, but we can do it in mice. And when I say we, I mean uh, my husband, Paul Franklin's lab. I was a very small part of this project. But um, in his lab, he was thinking, you know, we, we know so much about engrams, you know, um, we've been studying them for years. The real trick is to, okay, if we really know what's going on, can we, you know, implant an entirely false memory? So in my lab um, and in his lab, we do a lot of work with tones. So we pair the tone with the foot shock or he does a lot of work in context. So we pair context with a foot shock and he wanted to implant an artificial memory. So we don't quite know yet how exactly a tone is represented or a context is represented in the brain. So he used odors because we know an awful lot about how odors are represented in the brain. So um, each um, uh, particular odorant is represented in um, a particular olfactory glomerula. So he um, took advantage of transgenic mice that express channel rhodopsin, again, one of these excitatory optogenetic constructs in a particular glomeruli, M75. So he knows what odor activates this M75 glomeruli. So what he's gonna do, um, typically, so in, in a bunch of pilot experiments, what they did is took the odor that they know activates this glomeruli. So um, acetophenone, it smells like almonds to me, but acetophenone. So mice um, can certainly um, smell and, and, and know what acetophenone smells like. And they first paired that smell with a foot shock, just like we do in our, in our normal Pavlovian um, fear conditioning experiments. And then they presented acetophenone or another, um, a different odor. And um, the mice stayed away from the acetophenone. So they know that this particular odor predicts foot shock. So it's, it's very much like freezing, but they don't freeze to the other, they just stay away from it. So that's, so we know that the experiment could possibly work. So then instead of actually presenting the odor to the mouse, they optogenetically stimulated that specific glomerulus that they know is important in representing this odor. Yeah. And they paired that with a foot shock. So the mouse has never smelled this odor um, in the lab in its life. Yeah. And they still, um, stay away from that odor. Wow. And then they did the next level where they didn't even present a foot shock. They just optogenetically excited a part of the brain that induces behavior that looks like the mouse is getting shocked. So it looks like it's painful to the mouse. So they have a mouse sitting in a cage, getting optogenetic stimulation of a sort of smell and optogenetic stimulation of a sort of foot shock. Fair <laughs> enough. But then when they present them with the real smell that the mouse has never actually smelled before in its life, they stay away from the smell as if they've implanted a false memory. And you can say, well, mice stay away from smells for all sorts of different reasons. So they did the same thing, but this time paired it with food. So again, optogenetic stimulation paired of the smell paired with food, the mouse goes towards it, mm, there's the food. They did it all optogenetically, all in the brain, and the mouse now changed its behavior and approached the acetophenone, even though it's never smelled it before in its life. So it's, it, it feels like science fiction. It, it does, but it is, it's very intriguing. And this leads to, um, a, to, to two questions. So one is, um, I, I guess we'll, we'll kind of talk about implications for humans. Yeah. Um, there's there's uh, psychiatric 
disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder is one that's in the news a lot now, uh, where people keep recalling these terrible memories, you know, whether they're in a war like going on in Ukraine now or other traumatic experiences. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could somehow erase, selectively erase those memories? Can you talk about uh, first the work in animals in erasing memories and then your thoughts, you know, whatever they are on how this could be applied to humans? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. So um, our lab um, was one of the first, and I think now many labs can show that, yes, you can erase um, fear memories in the brain of a mouse. That, you know, when we deleted those cells and we don't have to permanently delete them, we can turn off the cells using optogenetics and the mouse acts like it doesn't recall the memory at all. So yes, it's possible to erase specific memories, not all memories, specific memories in the brain of a mouse. Um, do we have the technology to translate these findings to people? Not quite yet. So what we do is very invasive. Um, we uh, use optogenetics, we kill certain cells. We probably don't wanna do that in people. Um, I think that um, what we can do though is learn about the sort of basic principles that are going on and then use more um, less invasive um, uh, types of treatments for people. So we could find cells that are active when a person is recalling this very, very traumatic memory and give them like a smart drug. So instead of targeting every cell in their body, we could make a drug that only goes to those active cells and does something, I don't know, inhibits or synapses or do, does something to these cells. I'm not quite sure exactly what we would do, but do something like that. And then that sort of brings up, yep. Yeah. Can, can transcranial magnetic stimulation, my understanding you know, you know, in the word it's TMS, stimulation, but my understanding is with certain parameters you can also inhibit. Yeah, exactly. The, exactly, and I think there's a lot of progress that's being made on that front. Um, what they really need in the sort of TMS uh, world is to make it so it's targeted just to those cells that are active. Or, so, or just to the amygdala maybe. Yeah, even just to the amygdala. We don't want all sort of memories gone. We just want yeah. that particular memory gone. And I think that's that's a real challenge. Um, but I, I think that, you know, a bunch of, I think that that's a, that's a problem that we can solve. I think, I think it is a tractable problem. And then- now one, one way to inhibit the glutamatergic neurons in which maybe the, the engrams are encoded is to activate inhibitory GABAergic neurons. And you've, I saw you've done some work uh, looking at uh, roles for these inhibitory neurons in engrams. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So most of our work, as I said, has been done on these excitatory glutamatergic uh, neurons in the amygdala. But we've also found a really important role in, with the GABAergic inhibitory neurons. So it's, it's sort of like a push me, pull you sort of thing. So um, the more, uh, it, it turns out that the, the GABA inhibitory neurons play a real key role in keeping the engram sparse. So we don't want every neuron to be activated by a certain um, event. And if we um, disrupt the inhibitory signaling, then more neurons are activated. So they we are constraining the size of an engram and that the, that the memory is, is less precise. So the memory is more generalized. So there really is an important role for both um, GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in this process. So that it's, it's sort of a, a circle, so it doesn't really matter where you interrupt it, um, that different, different parts of it um, produce um, opposing effects. So you need everything to be working correctly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground, Sheena. Yes, yes, we have. Ah, uh, yes, there's still 
Oh my gosh, I forgot. Cool. Okay, so you all this up till now you've been talking about an engram. Right. But we 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 recall memories and sequences. We can kind of close our eyes and play a movie of you know what you and I, what did you do since you got up this morning and yes so on and and this is a, a bigger problem obviously it's getting more and more complex uh what's known so far about um about stringing together sequences of engrams and what do you see for the future of trying to understand that more complex aspect of this. Yeah. Now you're bringing up a really important point. We are studying an engram in the lab, and you know most other labs are as well. Then you know we we know that you know mice and even you know old professors like us can learn many many different things, and we have many many different memories. So how is it? We're looking at this process in isolation, pretending that. Um, that that's all there is. And of course that isn't all there is. And we think a really important um, function of engrams is to help organize information in our brain. So it's not you know, just stored everywhere that there is some underlying logic to it. So we found that um, using various, you know, we, we um, increased the number of things that we asked a mouse to remember. Usually it's one. And we increased it to two. So we doubled the information that we ask a mouse to remember. And we found that the engram underlying these two events, if they were very similar and occurred within a very similar uh, point in time, within about six hours of each other, that they had cells um, that made up their engram that were overlapping. And we thought this was important because if you remembered one thing that would activate the next engram and you would automatically remember the next thing. And that would help us to sort of organize information. So it wouldn't just be, you know, one event happened in isolation. It would be in a larger sort of context, a larger flow of things that had happened. And it also would help you chunk information that was similar. So you would have like a larger sort of concept or a, a schema or a, a, a bigger sort of knowledge of, the, of these kinds of events. Typically when this happens, this happens. And I know that because it's happened to be seven times and here are the seven different incidences and we, we sort of um, extract general principles from that. And we think that is one of the key functions of what engrams do is sort of really help you organize information in your brain. So it's not just a bunch of isolated incidences that there is um, you know, a rhyme and a logic to how they're encoded in your brain. And, and, and uh, Welder Penfield, when he uh, stimulated the brains of, of these uh, people, uh, sometimes they said things that were like a sequence of events. I, I'm seeing a girl in a room. Mm -hmm. So he's stimulating fairly crude electrodes that stimulating, but nevertheless, there's within that small area, there's organization and you can get a sequence strung together just by activating neurons. Exactly. So he, you know, I think, you know, his experiments are pretty much like science fiction as well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that this, that this happens. I mean, there's so many different ways that it could not happen. To, to actually think that it could happen is is pretty neat. And and we, you know, we have imagination, and we're we can generate. You know, your with with your husband husband's group shown that you can implant a false memory, but we're like. Isn't that what imagination is? And and to some extent is we're generating false memories when we are imagining something that didn't really happen. Yeah. So we know, we know that's possible and you're trying to get at exactly what's going on in the neural network, so. Yeah, so, so people call, um, so memories are like mental time travel. So we can go back in time or we can go forward in time, which is your imagination or what would happen or I imagine doing this or think think of actually taking a vacation, those sorts of things. And, and um, 
for a long time, um, psychologists have thought, well, starting with Endel Telving, um, that they are really one in the same process, that you know, thinking backwards is the same as thinking forwards. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, we covered a lot of ground and uh, yeah. I've enjoyed talking with you and I enjoyed reading up on what you've been doing. That's kind of the main thing I'm, I'm getting out of this is keeping up on what's going on in different areas of neuroscience. So thanks for your contribution to the podcast and it will fit nicely with uh, some of the others that I've already put up on the YouTube channel and some that are coming, for example, Eric Nessler's uh, coming up uh, down the road and uh, others. Fantastic. Ask him about those early days at Yale. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know I remember him from when he was with Paul Gringard. Absolutely. I was, I was good friends with Paul uh, because we actually I reviewed, uh, it was really interesting. I was on a study group that reviewed program project grants back in the late 80s, early 90s. And so we did site visits, right? So we went to Paul's lab and the other labs involved in the program project grant. and. You know, here's this guy who's like famous. It, he hadn't got the Nobel Prize yet, but, and like, he was very nervous. It was like, why is Paul nervous, man? He's like a, a <laughs> pioneer in his field, but uh, being a little nervous kind of motivates you. And uh, that's an important aspect of keeping on top of things too. Absolutely, right? absolutely, yeah. Well, this has been fun, Mark. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for taking the time, Sheena. Absolutely. Take care. Bye -bye.